Could you tell me where you were when Pearl Harbor was attacked? Well, I was uh, at my home in uh, southern Iowa, still on the farm. At that time, I'd had an older brother, about four years, that had uh, enlisted in the Army. At the time, he thought he was enlisting for one year's training and then was going to come back into the reserves, but it didn't work out that way. He uh, was put in the MPs and he was enjoying a truly great life. This would have been in uh, late 30s uh, and early 40s because he was being assigned all over the country to watch the uh, depots where they were transporting the soldiers to go and make sure the soldiers were conducting themselves in military manner as long as they were in uniform. These were groups of seven or eight guys and they'd be stationed in an apartment usually with a command car at their disposal and getting more money than you could make anywhere else because they were getting a per diem for their food. And he tried to prevail on me to enlist and join him because it was a great life. I thought, hey, that's worth a try. So I went to Des Moines and sat down in front of a recruiting sergeant and told him I wanted to enlist in the MPs. <laughs> and he, he looked at me like he thought I was probably a little bit unpossessed and said, you know, son, I've heard of military people being sentenced to serve the MPs, but he, I've never accepted an enlistment for the MPs. <laughs> so why don't you think about it a while? Well, I had knew at the time I wanted very much to be in the Air Corps. However, the Air Corps at that time required two years minimum of some kind of college credit, which I didn't have, nor did I figure I could get it in time to still get in the service. So I left everything in abeyance, and one September I was in Des Moines, Iowa, big sign on the sidewalk that said, college requirement no longer required. And I noticed it was right in front of the Air Corps, U.S. Army Air Corps enlistment station. So I went in and talked to him about it. He says, yeah, you don't have to have uh, college, just pass an equivalence test. When are you giving it? I'll be giving one at 8 o'clock in the morning. I'll be here. So I went down and uh, took the test. Of course, I reviewed it. There were several pages of it. There's supposed to be 150 questions. And as I reviewed it, I noticed there's about three blank pages. And I thought, well, that's funny, but I looked, the room was crowded, and I thought, well, I've got these three blanks. This guy has probably got three other blanks. That way we don't copy off each other, you know. So I hustled through it. seemed like an awfully easy test. And uh, finished it up, looked around. Everybody else was still busy at their desks. So I checked them one at a time, all the way through. Looked around, everybody's still busy at their desk. So I thought, not this much difference. Checked it again. Took it up to the sergeant. He said, don't you want to check it? I said, I've checked it twice. Fine, have a chair. I'll grade him a little bit. We'll know who passed. Well, at that time, the test was graded by an overlay sheet with a bunch of slots in it. Our answers were all to mark a black M in a slot. And he just put an overlay sheet over it. And any slot that wasn't blackened got a red mark. And then he'd count the red marks. And total it up and find out what we made. Well, he read the names of those who passed and mine wasn't on it. Now, we had to get 85 out of 150 to pass the test. So I said, Sergeant, would you please look, and I could remember the test number. We recorded not by our names, but by test number. I said, Sergeant, would you look and see what number so-and-so had? He looked, 78, not quite enough. So I head for my sister's house. She lived in an apartment in Des Moines, and uh, I kept booting myself in the rear as I walked along. 78 out of 150, what kind of an idiot could this possibly be anyway? And uh, finally, the 150 started logging on me, and it, I realized that I didn't have 150 questions, because that blank sheet would begin with the question, the, Last sheet would end with question 29, and after I got to the blank sheet, it might be question 41. Finally, don't know. It didn't have 150 questions. So I hustled to the phone booth. There was a nickel at that time. <laughs> so I hustled to the phone booth, dropped a nickel in, and called the sergeant and said, Would you check test number so and so? 
Well, why should I do that? I said, I just got through taking it, but I don't think it was all there. I think they had some blank pages one moment. He looked at it, came back. What the hell did you take this test for? I said, that's the one you gave me. Well, it had IC right on the front of it. What does that mean? Incomplete. <laughs> so, <laughs> would you like to take it again? When? Nine o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I'll be there. <laughs> so, I looked at the first thing you did and looked at it, and all the sheets were full. Oh, 150 questions was there, so I went this and through it. And when they read the scores that time, there was one old boy that beat me. He was from Iowa State College, second year physics major, and he had 138 out of 150. Mm -hmm. I only had 135 out of 150 with my, with my high school education, you know. So I was sworn in on the spot and I waited my call till uh, was the following January. And I was called in to a regular U.S. Army enlistment recruiting base, Jefferson Barracks, Missouri, in January. Bitterest winter I believe they had there all the time we were there. And they positioned us in these little old square huts, they called them, built out of green shiplap lumber with a square pointed roof. And they had a little inverted funnel-shaped stove sitting in the middle of the tent. And the pipe was a four and a half inch pipe that ran straight through the roof. Bit of cold. So being a farm boy, I went out gathering wood dead limbs and, and remnants of the construction built a fire. That old stove got red hot in minutes, but that was fighting off the chill all right. Well, that worked pretty good, except the lumber was green, and the next morning when we woke up, there was a crack between each and every one of those green boards, and the snow had blown in and was laying on our covers, not even melted, <laughs> just white streaks. <laughs> so, but we managed to survive it. We got extra blankets. Our first night was under one blanket, but we got extra blankets and they gave us, uh, we burned up the scrap lumber, but they got coal in there and we survived that pretty well then. We spent an exact 30 days in Jefferson Barracks learning the soldier. This is how you march, this is your right foot, you always start with it, you know, or whatever it was. And uh, they gave us another battery of tests then. Never knew what it was for at the time, but that segregated us into groups. And the first group spent one month at Jefferson Barracks, and then we got shipped out to a school. Well, the purpose of the school was to try to replace this college that we didn't have. And I got assigned to Creighton University in Omaha, Nebraska. Beautiful Catholic school. Teachers, first time they'd ever seen a uniform. And it was a marvelous experience. And at the end of the month, I had stuff all packed waiting to ship out. And lo and behold, mumps. So they sent me to the hospital, Fort Crook Hospital. We got over there. It was full of, uh, of TB and mumps. And I had a, a, a nice cut out on the screen in Fort <laughs> <laughs> Great case of mumps. It wasn't bad, but they had ice, mumps was treated with ice at the time. And of course, I developed the rarest case yet, swelling in every possible area at the maximum. And this Texas nurse was always kidding me about my swollen organs, you know, <laughs> how horrible they were. Hold that ice back up. Can I just drop it, Mr. Thomas? <laughs> and that wasn't enough because about the first week I was there, I see her leading through a group of teenagers in civilian clothes. They were planning to go into nursing school, so she was showing them everything that she had in her hospital. And lo and behold, they moved into the mumps area, just like they did the other area, you know, and I thought, good Lord, she's always talking about my swollen organs. I wonder if she'd bring them over <laughs> Sure enough, here they came. And she went through fingers. Now notice the swelling here, ladies. See how it's equal under both jaws and everything else? And I thought, well, I'm going to get away with it. Next move, covers all the way back. Next move, take the ice pack. <laughs> and so she showed them what she claimed as the most classic case of mump swelling she had ever observed. 
Of course, I was red enough to light a match on the cheek, you know, and she recognized it, but she thanked me profusely for being such a patient, patient, so she could show this to the girls, you know. You know, it, the, uh, I don't recall finding any other thing in the entire four and a plus years of service that was as embarrassing to me as that was. <laughs> it didn't, I guess it didn't shorten the life any. Well, after we got through with Omaha then, we, they shipped us to San Antonio, which was all cadets at that time went through San Antonio. And that consisted of a uh, month's pre-flight training, we call it, uh, and a uh, month's of classification. And we went through that, and then at the end of that pre-flight training, they uh, divided us up into training schools. Well, we all went to the same primary trainer, a little single agent Fairchild, P219, and my assignment was to Chickasha, Oklahoma, uh, which I enjoyed very much. It was operated by civilians at the time, so that was another less than military experience because the food was cafeteria style and everything, and they made their beds and all that other stuff. Next assignment was Coffeyville, Kansas, back in the Army. Tar paper shacks, 40 men on one floor, and we took care of ourselves, marched the mess hall and everything else. And beyond that then, uh, that was basic training, we spent uh, just about two months there, and then went to Victoria, Texas for the advanced training. And at Coffeyville, they divided us into fighter pilots and uh, bomber pilots, and I, much to my joy, qualified for fighter pilots and went to uh, Victoria, Texas for training in the AT-6. Well, now that I'm, getting, I'm training to be a fighter pilot, I had one question left in my mind. I had heard of the Thunderbolt. I'd never seen one, but I wanted to fly. So that was harboring in my mind. <coughs> maybe, just maybe, I'll get the Thunderbolt. Well, we saw the assignments posted at the end of graduation, and lo and behold, Richmond, Virginia, P-47. <laughs> no. I get my last wish granted, and we uh, finished our training. We had uh, partial training in Richmond, and then in Dover, Delaware, for gunnery and uh, aerial bombing, and then we were shipped back to Richmond to await assignment. Well, we drew issue to go to England, and uh, we had a storm at sea that uh, canceled the ship. We waited for the next ship, and we still kept our cold weather uniform, so we again assumed that Europe, England somewhere. And we get word, just before we ship out, we get word that there's a German U-boat wolf back off the Atlantic coast, so they delayed that shipment. So we're still sort of in limbo land there, getting tired of eating field rations in Richmond, Virginia. But <laughs> and they loaded us on a train, and we headed south, still with our winter clothing. And I wondered where in the world we'd go south with winter clothing. But we finally got to Miami Beach. They checked us in a hotel down there, and we turned in our winter uniforms and got some summer uniforms and a whole started round of tropical shots. Well, we finally got that round completed, and they loaded us on uh, a C-46, and we started jungle hopping over northern South America. And when we finally got to Natal, Brazil, they parked a, P a C-47s and or C-46s and sevens, and gave us the B-24. We still didn't know where we were going. We'd take the tropical shots, had summery clothing. And we're joined there by a USO tour, which included Jinx Falkenberg, Pat O'Brien, and three starlets whose names I don't even remember. And they first words, oh, you guys are going to CBI too. <laughs> we didn't know, well, that's where we're going, so now we know who <laughs> see. And that was an interesting trip too. The, uh, the most interesting part of it was in the middle of the night, I was awakened by strong gasoline fumes. And I look out in the darkness, I could see our far right prop on that B-24 was feathered. And gasoline fumes so strong, I couldn't sleep. And I thought, we must be in trouble. Maybe I ought to wake everybody up. And then I looked down, and all I could see was the 
the fluorescence from those white caps that erupt in the ocean, several, you know, probably a mile, mile and a half below us. And I thought, well, what would we do if I woke them up? So I just looked, let that pass, try and go back to sleep. Next thing I noticed is another engine shutting down. I looked, and it was the other right-hand engine. Now, I hadn't flown four engine planes, but I knew that if you had two on one side that were bad, you had a problem of some sort. But he's revving up these two left engines full four, and we're still doing pretty good. And after a while, I see the engines fanning and restarting everything else. I was the only guy that observed that. Everybody else sound asleep, snoring, you know, enjoying the trip. And when we finally landed at Ascension Island, I cornered the old pilot and I said, you got to tell me, why do you shut down two engines on one side over the Atlantic Ocean? Oh, we do it all the time. I was transferring fuel out of the bomb bay into those wing tanks and that fuel line goes right behind that exhaust ring of those two engines. You got to shut them down. <laughs> to him, it's just part of his day's work, you know. But, and it was educational to me. Well, we finally got to uh, Accra, West Africa, got a B-24 and got back in twin engine planes. <clears throat> and they got us across the African continent, across part of Asia to Moran, India, which was a, uh, one of the northernmost colonies. And we were assigned to the 33rd fighter group for orientation, they called it. And I flew only three missions with them. And within uh, a month, I was transferred across the mountain into a little strip, Xinguiang, Burma, which was in the most northern province of Burma, and uh, joined the 80th fighter group. And at that time, only the 88th squadron was at that field. And uh, I got thorough, thorough orientation and uh, started the missions there. And within a few months, we moved forward to get closer to the battle lines to uh, strip the Japanese had built at Michino, Burma. And uh, I flew the remaining combat missions from that strip. And the, about May of uh, 45, the British patted us on the back and said, hey, you've been great, and, but we don't we, we have to have you anymore. And I thought, well, fine, we'll go home. Didn't. We went to an old B-29 base at Dudkundia, India, which is about 90 miles west of Calcutta. And we got over there, there was a couple of bomb groups, and uh, the old 33rd group, the fighter group, was over there with their fighters. They'd gone to P-38s. And we we're being formed into something called the Far East Air Force. But what? The war is over. What's this for? Well, we still haven't got Japan. We we're bombing the heck out of them with B-29s and Zendries, killing them by the hundreds of thousands each and every night. But they weren't convinced that we were going to win. So we were organizing that group for the sole purpose of supporting a land invasion of all five islands one at a time. And I had already heard what had happened in Okinawa. They had occupied that, you know, and I knew that the Japanese mothers had thrown their kids over the cliff and uh, then followed them with the last leap. And I thought, good Lord, five Japanese islands. I wonder if the Japanese race will really survive or will they all commit suicide? Well, we went to work on it and uh, we got all of our people with who wanted to go home and had the points to go home went home from Dutkanya. I had the points. I hadn't been in battle yet. And my, I had 102 missions behind me, but I hadn't seen a single enemy plane in the air. And in my mind, I hadn't really been at war yet. You know, we, we were flying all these missions over the heads of the OSS, and they were cheering us like a winning football team. Boy, I wish you could see those little so-and-so run, you know. <laughs> and uh, I was thirsting, I thought, for uh, some aerial combat. And I was Delighted that I was going there, and I had been promoted to a uh, flight leader, and I had uh, a group of replacements that some of them had more time than I had because they'd been in Panama and flying patrols and various things. They had more hours than I had, but they didn't have any combat time at all. And uh, the 14th day of September, now mind you, we dropped the atomic bombs in August. 
But the 14th day of September, we still hadn't had word that the war was over, and I had a group up polishing them. We were having a blast, and I looked over, and here's a black smoke boiling out of one of those old big 29 hangers, and I recognized black smoke as being burning rubber, and I also knew that that particular hanger was filled with brand new tires. Now, at that time, in September of 45, the British and the Asiatic Indians were shooting each other. The Indians had had all the British rule that they thought they really needed, you know, for one, one <laughs> a, a group of citizenry, and uh, they were actually firing on the British. And I thought, boy, oh boy, the sabotage has spilled over. They're burning our... So I called again, very frantically, in fact, and all I get was, Roger, I thought, what's the matter with those idiots, you know? And in my thinking, I turned to head in another direction, and here's another hanger boiling out yellow smoke. What are uniforms <clears throat> to replace their summer uniforms? Now I know it's sabotage. I call again, Roger, come on back and land. And on the 14th day of September of 1945, I landed our group at Dud Kenya. And they told us, once we got on the ground, that the war was over, that we're going to pack up and go home. So I get the screwdriver out. I want to recover that eight-day clock out of my personal airplane for a souvenir, you know. But I just parked it two hours before. But by the time I get out there, there's a tall soldier with a turban and a shroud. He must have stood six and a half feet tall, and he was carrying an old British infield that was nearly as tall as he was, I believe with that three-foot bayonet on the end a little taller than he was. And I get as close to that airplane as I am to you. Halt! Huh? Here's the point of this bayonet about this close to my chest. Well, you know, you halt. <laughs> and that turned out to be the only word he knew in English was halt. I tried to reason with him that I wanted to recover that eight-day clock. The bayonet didn't move. <laughs> So I, I finally moved, and two days later, I watched the Corps of Engineers crush that plane with bulldozers at each end of the wings and to the tail until it was as small as they could get it, and it was sold for scrap. We uh, got on, it took us about a month and a half to get on a boat and finally head for home, and we... Uh, that was a tremendous experience because we boarded it in Calcutta on the Hooghly River. Now the Hooghly is navigable as long as the tides are high. But the tide going out may or may not leave a sand deposit in the navigable, navigable channel of the Hooghly. And we're loaded on that old boat ready to head home and he gets up ahead of steam and heads downstream and he'd gone about the length of the vessel and we felt the shudder. The tide had left the sandbar. So now we're not only not headed home, we're away from the shore, we're on sea rations, seafood, you know, that what the Navy puts together. And our clothes are all packed up, we sleep on the boat. The food was good, better than we'd ever had. The Navy understood food, they did a great job with it, and we thoroughly enjoyed that. And we finally got out of the river, however, and we where the ship was commanded by an old uh, admiral who had spent 27 years in the Navy and getting us home was the last thing he had to do. They told us it would take us 30 to 32 days to get across the Atlantic at home. Now, for some reason, instead of coming across the Pacific, we went back around the Indian Ocean and refueled in Ceylon because we couldn't get out of the Hooghly with a full load of fuel. And then up through the Suez Canal and Mediterranean Straits and Gibraltar and back to New York. Well, that old ship, storms and all, had this constant shiver, constant shiver. I could tell he was going full bore. We had a storm in the North Atlantic, which was really, really miserable. Everybody on board got seasick, and the old captain, the next morning when the storm was over and the sun was out, he said, if any of you guys got seasick, don't feel bad. He said, I've been making this route for 17 years now, and that was the worst storm I've ever seen. So we felt quite a bit better. And that constant shiver of that rudder 
got us home in 27 days. <laughs> and I walked into my house in Iowa with my family Thanksgiving morning about 9 o'clock. 1945. Uh, I had 30 days delay en route, of course, and then I reported back for my extra year that I signed up for. Probably shut that off. Um, Probably not. But, yeah, we'll um, extra year I signed up for, I had to go to Santa Ana, California. Now, mind you, we docked in New York City. I went home to Iowa, spent the third days, then got on a train and went all the way to Santa Ana, California for reassignment. The reassignment turned out to be St. Louis, Missouri. <laughs> so <laughs> I got to see a lot of the U.S., but I didn't get all the way around the world. And that last year in the military was probably my most memorable year. I ended up uh, inherited the last totally segregated black raw Air Corps recruits. Um, I, they had been trained previously in Texas and Louisiana, but uh, things were getting a little touchy at, at the time, and I'd read about some uh, near riots in Texas and Louisiana, and uh, we had a bird colonel in St. Louis that was hoping to get one star before he retired. So he wrote to the uh, commanding general of the Gulf Coast Training Command and asked him if, he says, I've got a fine cadre of mostly northern uh, Air Force officers up here, if I can do you any good, let me know. Well, he didn't get a reply to his letter. He got a train load of troops instead, almost by return mail. <laughs> so he fell to, uh, none of us, of course, had had any administrative training of any kind. We had had, uh, we understood the military because we'd been at it a long time. And uh, my initial assignment was what they called D flight, which was uh, 320 men. And we went through three commanding officers so fast that I can't even remember all their names. Because it was segregated or? They were segregated, yeah. And the colonel was trying to operate the segregated troops with all white non-coms. Well, those northern white non-coms weren't accustomed to black troops. And the black troops had already tasted the success of, you're just picking on me because that's black. Yeah. And, uh, Thomas, you know, good Lord, what's it after us idiots? I've said that many times. But Thomas is the end of the alphabet, so I carried a D flight for my first 320 men. Well, the only non com I had left was a buck sergeant that was an alcoholic, and he had tobacco running down his cheeks to try to hide the alcohol, and I didn't have enough non coms to handle four breaks. So I lined them up 80 minutes at a time and I said, now you're in charge of this 80 and you're in charge of this 80. And I had one white non com and four black squ uh, squadron sergeants. And uh, it worked. Mm. I didn't have sense enough to understand what I was doing. I did what I had to do. <laughs> but those boys enjoyed the responsibility of 80 men. And they saw to it that those 80 men did exactly as they were told. And consequently, when, when the stuff hit the fan, so to speak, A flight, B flight, and C flight was always in trouble. D flight, we'd just go ahead about our business, you know. <laughs> and the word got out, and the colonel one day called me up. I wanted to know, Mr. Lieutenant Thomas, if you would have time to come up and visit with me for a while. Well, you know, when the colonel says, do you have time to come visit me, at first lieutenant usually said, yes, sir, <laughs> just as soon as he could, which I did. So I went up to visit with him, and what the visit was about was would the lieutenant feel that he might be able to handle all four flights, A, B, C, and D, 32, or 1,300 men? Well, yes, sir, if you think so, we'll give it a go. Well, very good. What can I do to help you? By that time, I understood the convenience and necessity of my black acting sergeants. I said, remove every white non-com from that area and let me appoint my own. And we did. It worked. 
And that letter you read was the thanks I got for. He didn't get his star, but he didn't lose his eagle either. So <laughs> it worked out very well. The uh, that last year when I signed up for it overseas, I had high hopes of finding something I could do in the Air Corps that I would continue to enjoy. But that duty in St. Louis was affected in two ways. Number one, I had to find time to fly because I had plenty of other work to do. And number two, when I found time to fly, it might be to fly an airplane that I hadn't been in for three years. And maybe it had been on only twice before because you had to take what was there and what was fueled and what was ready. And flying was no longer, not only wasn't fun, it wasn't even comfortable because I was always in a strange airplane doing strange things. And uh, so at the end of that year, I decided, surely this is enough. I did stay in the reserves for about another five years. But my records in the reserves, I was, went to college, of course, and got moved around several different uh, areas while I was in training with my first employer. And with the change of addresses and all, when my reserve commission enlistment had expired, I couldn't understand because my reserve unit had been called up and had gone to Korea. I couldn't understand why my name didn't come up. Finally, the answer came. Here came a letter from the reserves in Minneapolis that had followed me to every mailing address I had had from the time of before I went into the Army. And the question on the letter was, your enlistment has expired. Do you wish to renew it? <laughs> well, this was in August of 1950. I had a brand new son, a brand new mortgage, and I was just getting really into my first job. And I gave him a very short answer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, do you mind if I ask you some questions? Not a bit. Go, sir. Sure. I've got several, actually. Um, first off, when you talked about how they separated you guys into different groups, uh, I believe in Richmond, Virginia, is that the separation took place between bombers and fighters? The, that happened in uh, Coffeyville, Kansas. Oh, that's where it was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what, what do you think the Army Air Corps is looking for when they determine which person went in which group? Uh, number one was how we handled the single engine plane. And number two was our response. They give us all these emergencies, you know. You're just out of fuel and shut off for gas. They'd make us find the field, go ahead, they'd make us go into the final approach to the landing before they'd switch the gas back on. Mm -hmm. uh, the responses we had to all of those things that the instructors could dream of, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. And if we had at it and solved it with a great deal of vigor and glee, why they kept us on the fighter list. Got it. So was it was it more difficult to make the fighter list then generally? Yes it was. Yes it was. Now, this is something I can't understand. <laughs> the, the bomber, of course, is like driving a bus compared to a sports car, but the responsibility of a bomber pilot just bothers your mind. He's got 10 men there he's responsible for. And uh, what happens to the navigator? What happens to the tail gunner? That's a lot of area to cover. And uh, I am not sure what the criteria for the separation of it all was. Some of it was choice. Some of the guys made that choice early on. They were big, heavy, you know, and they enjoyed uh, driving big equipment, sort of like a guy that loves to drive a truck, you know. Bombers was their choice. But the, uh, I had opted for fighters, and I was, the thing that worried me, I was at the exact height and weight limit. Exact. And what was that? Do you remember? Six feet even and 180 pounds. And uh, I had, that kind of worried, worried me, and I was mighty glad when I was given the decision. <laughs> nice. And you also mentioned that you've wanted to fly Thunderbolts even before you started flying. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Would you like to fly a Thunderbolt? I read, I've seen a picture of it, and I read that it was the most powerful and the most heavily armed fighter we had ever built. And I don't know. I work big horses. I wanted to have a big machine. <laughs> Growing up on a farm, you know, the, 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 a big two-horse team of really big horses always impressed me. So, two thousand horses was something I sort of pined for. Oh, yeah. 
Well, could you describe what it was like flying the Thunderbolt? Well, actually, it was a very easy plane to fly. Now, I didn't really get to understand the flying of the Thunderbolt until I got overseas. In training, we flew old war weary Thunderbolts on 90 octane fuel. Well, with the 90 octane fuel, we couldn't put that throttle to the firewall because the fuel would stand it and start detonating. And I had to wait till I got overseas before I could really ring that thing out and understand the joy I had in my hands. <laughs> what are some of the strengths and weaknesses of the Thunderbolt in your view? Um, the only weakness I would say would be the fact that it required a pretty sturdy field to work from. Now the British and the uh, Americans in Britain flew them off grass fields. Uh, their grass, I am sure, was quite different from the grass we had in Burma. I didn't see a single field in Burma that I'd want to put that seven tons down in. <laughs> but they, they did that in England and in France and in Germany after the war was settled. But the, uh, it's awful hard beyond its requirement. I wouldn't say that there was a weakness as much as it was a requirement. Its strength, of course, was the fact that it had eight 50 caliber guns and we carried 420 rounds of ammunition for each gun. Oh, I didn't know that. It's a lot of ammo. <laughs> and uh, it would handle two 1,000 pound bombs or napalm tanks or whatever and we could still carry a 50 gallon belly tank to extend the range. Its one weakness probably was the fact that it was pretty good gas scuttler. But we learned how to cope with that, too. The uh, Republic gave us recommended settings for various uh, altitudes, various uh, requirements. And we discovered that if we boost the manifold pressure beyond the rec recommendations of Republic and retard the RPMs back to where we could hear the detonation from that high manifold pressure setting, we could get by with about 85 gallons an hour instead of 120. So we stretched its range quite a bit just by learning what it could do. And uh, that, would, I would say, was its only weakness, the fact that it was required a great deal of fuel. The, uh, as a weapons platform, I can't imagine anything nicer because seven tons, you don't feel a lot of thermals in it. You know, you can, you can feel a jolt, but it doesn't move the plane. When you line that thing up on a sight line, that's where your bullets went. Good exactly point. where it went. I hadn't thought about that. It's not going to get buffeted. That's exactly as right. As it would. Yeah. Well, could you describe uh, some typical missions that you were asked to fly during the war? Um, the, uh, there's two typical missions. <clears throat> the, uh, for a close support mission, most of the time, we just used our guns. And what we would do, <clears throat> they would direct us in a direction. The uh, Burmese landscape, you, they could set, tell you to follow a river, but that was about all we had to follow. So they usually just give us a heading and we'd fly and we'd, uh, we'd know that we could chart on the map in our early room what the distance was. So we'd judge it and you know when the, the right number of minutes elapsed, we'd call in. USS Avengers, two-way radio, just like walkie-talkies, you know. Boy says, and so, oh yeah, you're close, I can see you up there, Give me your, you need about another minute, you know, and then we get down, they'd say, you're right overhead now, circle, we'll describe the area. And they would, they would describe that area right down to the last detail of the land that they could see, they were looking through binoculars, and they could see the lines that were sporting. And when they'd finally get described and we'd read how oh, we think we got it, they'd ask us for a short machine gun burst to make sure we were in the right spot. Well, often we were, and every now and then we'd be asked to make a correction of a few yards, one way or the other. And then if they asked us to make a correction, we'd give them another squirt at that correction, and then they would start bragging on us. Boy, you got them. You're right exactly where they ought to be. Give them everything you got. <laughs> Then as we'd go through the motion circling and passing, it was almost like a, <clears throat> a landing pattern. We'd make a pass, circle around, make another pass, circle around, make another pass. Now, you wonder why we made so many passes. Well, those guns were bore sighted for 1,000 feet. 
So you're doing about 240 miles an hour, you've got an effective pass time of about three seconds. That's all. Yeah. And in three seconds, you're probably going to squirt up out of all eight guns, probably less than 200 rounds total. So you can make a lot of passes. And every so often they'd say, well, that's pretty well wiped out there. Let's look at another one. And then they describe another place. We'd move over to that. As when we were carrying bombs, uh, those would usually be loaded on only for specific purposes to go after a, uh, a uh, storage yard or a, uh, a building that they thought was being used for storage or an actual weapons dump that they could see through the binoculars. And all the bombs would be dropped one at a time for the very good reason that if one bomb does it, say the next one, we've got another place for it. All of our uh, equipment, ammunition, gasoline, bombs, and everything else were flown over. And they, they always told us it took seven gallons of gasoline to deliver one gallon that we could burn. So seven to one was the ratio. Mm -hmm. A 500 pound bomb, or a 1,000 pound bomb, took 7,000 pounds of fuel to deliver mm -hmm. one bomb. So we use everything quite sparingly, and for good reason. Could you describe what life was like on the ground in between missions? Uh, what, 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 the, what were the living conditions like? The, uh, those varied too. The first place at Shingyang was right in the middle of the rainforest. They whittled out a runway that was downhill. We didn't matter where the wind was, we took off downhill, we landed uphill. Wind didn't matter because there was these huge trees on both sides of the runway. It wasn't much wind got down to where the runway was. And at that place, it rained almost every day. The summer we were there, we had 200 inches of rainfall in that one summer. So everything was wet. We, uh, our, winter, our uh, dress uniforms, we'd have to try to hang them outside to air out so the, the mildew didn't set in. And with the rain going on, we couldn't always do that. But everything around us was wet and soaked and sudden. We did have, however, have uh, latrine facilities and bath facilities. I don't remember anywhere where we didn't have that. We had uh, dried eggs, dried potatoes, and dried powdered milk. But we were also blessed with a mess sergeant that understood all of those things. And he could make mashed potatoes that so helped me. I couldn't have distinguished from fresh out of the patch. And he could take that powdered milk and the powdered eggs and the scrambled eggs. I couldn't wait to have them every morning. Mm -hmm. I was on the, one of the few idiots that they considered dumb enough to get up for breakfast. But they always looked for me. <laughs> and I always looked for the eggs. Growing up on a farm, breakfast was always the main, main meal, you know, 6 a.m. Mm -hmm. If you didn't get that under your belt, you weren't fit for a day's work. Yeah. So that was a habit I formed. And I, to this day, I still enjoy breakfast. Mm -hmm. What about the other place, where you, the other base you were stationed? Michino was uh, in the uh, prairie-like area. We had a lot of uh, green pastures around there. Now the farmers didn't use the pastures, but the wild water buffalo did. There was always you could always see herds of those grazing around. Now the uh, the, the air was nice and fresh. You could hang clothing out to dry. You didn't have to hang them out to air. You could hang them out to dry. And uh, that area was really quite nice. I enjoyed it. We had good facilities there. And uh, the area was so nice that the Red Cross girls even had a station around. Mm -hmm. We could see donuts now and then and coffee. You know, <laughs> things like that. <laughs> what about the locals? Did you have a chance to meet any local population, the indigenous peoples? Uh, we made uh, one interesting trip. I spoke none of the language. We had uh, a local tent boy that we used in all, all the places except Shingyang. They We didn't have any there. And uh, we made one other tour out of Michinaw. There was an old jade mine there. Now we knew the mine was there, but we didn't know for sure where it was. And the reason we knew the mine was there, we'd see the Chinese girls would come pit patting over the mountain there east of us, and they'd be carrying baskets of eggs or sometimes little pigs wrapped in a bamboo cage with the legs and snout out, you know, and they'd be on this pole, on one on each shoulder, and the, as they went along, the pigs would go, <coughs> you know, because these girls set up this even pace. But the idea being, when the girls rested, 
they'd leave these pigs tied to this bamboo pole they put over the shoulder, and they could root and graze and eat nuts and whatever, you know, to get them through. And we learned that they were going to a jade mine about 40 miles west of us there. They'd trade the pigs for jade or the eggs or whatever. So we found out where the jade mine was and decided to make a trip to that. Well, it was at a place called uh, Mogon. And when we got over there, there was an English interpreter that said that that mine had been visited by Marco Polo when he inspected the old silk routes. That's some history there. <clears throat> and um, it hadn't changed much from Marco Polo's day. Really? <laughs> it was a sliding hole down into the ground, and when we got there, we heard uh, all this grunting and going on. Every so often, a rock, like a hammer hitting a rock. And finally, they had a little old car, a little old flatbed car on two very narrow rails. They pulled out this lump of jade, which was probably uh, two feet in diameter and three feet long. Mm -hmm. They broke it off that load that was down there. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and there was enough English spoken there that I bartered for, for some jade. <clears throat> and uh, my wife still has it. Oh, that's really cool. It's, it is cool. It is fantastic. And it, it was uh, moss jade, which is a very dark green with, you hold it up to light, and you can actually see this, this mossy running through it, which is my favorite. Now, out of that mine, strangely enough, they could get uh, what they called mutton jade, which was kind of white. They could get a pinkish jade. All of it, I guess, was just different different age of the material, was the only thing I could figure. But it turned out that all of this Chinese jade you hear about comes from that mine. Hmm. They take it to China and carve it into these beautiful little things and sell it as Chinese jade because it's been processed. But the Burma has the mine. The Chinese have the art. I didn't know that. <laughs> I didn't know that. You mentioned um, the orientation you received, the extensive orientation which you made it into the CBI. Yeah. Could you describe what, what, they were, what information you received? Oh, uh, number one, that it was a British colony, and number two, that uh, the British were not totally welcome there. But number three, that uh, even though we were allies of the British, they still had great respect for the Americans, which they did. And before we got out of there, they, <clears throat> when they, had, they too could see that the war was coming up, those that could speak English would buttonhole us after the war saw you and me, British. Wow. You and me. They didn't really like the British at all then. <laughs> no, they didn't. The uh, British have been there too long. Yep. And they uh, they were a little bit, I don't know what the word is, but they uh, they were treated like colonists, you know. Yep. And the, the, it was their land, the British were occupying it, so it wasn't, they weren't colonists. Yeah. <laughs> and they, uh, <clears throat> They seemed they couldn't, when they worked in their tents and everything, they couldn't do enough for us. They uh, managed everything for us. They took care of their shoe shines and made their beds, saw to it that the laundry was done and done right. We didn't, we couldn't speak the language, but our house men would take care of it. Just, that was their job. Mm -hmm. Nice. You know, and of course, when people think of the, uh, the CBI theater, they often think early on of the ABG, the Flying Tigers, they think of Merrill Marauders. Mm -hmm. um, did you have a chance to, to, to meet those individuals or to support any of the missions for the Marauders? The Merrill's Marauders, <coughs> we were over their heads from their origin till their God help us demise. Yeah. Uh, they started, Steelwell was, was saddled with that area. Steelwell and um, who was their commanding general of the ground forces? Not Hap Arnold, but uh, MacArthur. No, yeah, the, uh, he was the U.S. I oh. can't remember his name now. But he and Steelwell were uh, West Point buddies. Yeah. And this guy gave Steelwell a job of finding someone to handle the CBI theater. And the first guy he interviewed was uh, was Pershing's old aide de camp from World War One, who had recently retired, but he was a three-star general. And uh, that was the first choice of uh, the, uh, I'll think of that guy's name. That was his first choice, and he told Stilwell to go talk to him. So he went down, nah, he didn't want any of that. He'd spent some time in that theater, and he knew what was going on. Well, Stilwell's folks had been missionaries in uh, China 
and he spoke the Chinese language fluently and understood the Chinese mind. And in disgust, they finally asked Stilwell if he'd go. He said, I'm a soldier. You tell me where to go, that's where I'll go. So we ended up with it. And he uh, tried his best. There was plenty of soldiers over there. Chiang Kai-shek had literally 14 divisions that he was supposed to have. But he was getting paid for 14 divisions. He probably had between 9 and 10 divisions. Mm -hmm. Now the Chinese handle their payroll a little differently than we do. We used to count out each soldier. China gives the general the payroll. And he, if he can find the soldier, give him the money. If he can't, we put it in his pocket. Wow. So his, he didn't know how many troops he had, really. But he wasn't interested in losing any of them, either. So Stilwell could not coerce him into actually supporting what we were doing down there. Nor could he uh, coerce the British into supporting what we were doing there. So he finally came up with the idea of this volunteer, all volunteer group, which they call, and he put them under the command of General Merrill, and that's where the name Merrill's Marauders came from. And these guys were rec recruited from all over. Some of them had been helped build the Alaska Alkine Highway and wherever. Just, and they just were told if you had a, a uh, opportunity to be in a very unusual group that would face probably severe battle, but probably for no longer than a few months. So he recruited Merrill Marauders, and they started from Lido with about uh, 3,000 plus men, as I recall. Now this, this may not be exactly right. And by air, where they were going, Michinaw, 750 miles. On the ground, it was probably more like 1,800 miles. They started their journey with a lot of good old Missouri mules to carry the packs. A lot of the mules couldn't hold a footing on the wet mountain slopes, and they ended up in the bottom of the canyon. And Merrill's marauders would send some guys down there to recover what they had to have and carry it back up on the shoulders and proceed down the path with it. They uh, got dysentery, they had malaria, they had everything in the world, and by the time they got to Michinaw, they had about 700 people that were still on their feet. Most of them are already dead. Some of them have been dropped off in hospitals. Well, they, uh, he had coerced Chiang Kai-shek into uh, supporting that actual taking of Michinaw, but they hadn't trained for it, and consequently they ended up, the Chinese soldiers ended up shooting at each other. Some of them were deep into the town, some of them were outside of the town, and they were just shooting back and forth at each other. And Stilwell saw that the Japanese were going to be whipped if he could hold out just a few more minutes, and he was greatly criticized for being the brute to send MPs into the hospital, and if anybody could stand on their feet and shoulder a rifle, he needed to come out there and help him. Mm. And they did, and we won. And we landed on the old airstrip, and our early missions off the mission or airstrip was still had the problem of a Japanese gun emplacement off the far end of the runway. And so they'd take off short, circle around, drop a bomb on you, come back, land, and get another one. Take off short. <laughs> crazy war. That sounds like it. It's totally <laughs> crazy war. And some of those boys got in as many as six missions a day. <laughs> Just about as fast you can take off the land, you know. <laughs> cool and, but we eventually wiped them out of there and uh, got them on the run. And uh, then we, of course, after we occupied Mission all we had to push them farther and farther. Bamo was a uh, area that was fought for very diligently. I had some uh, several missions in that area. And the Merrill Marauders, we actually patrolled over their heads as they were going down through the mountain because the Japanese were famous for leaving back some expendables just to shoot people as they went by, you know. And they didn't, they leave them there with nothing but a gun and a pocket full of ammo. They could kill rats and eat locusts and whatever they could find to eat. But when these Marauders go by, shoot a few of them. Wow. So we'd patrol over their heads, and if that happened, we'd they zero us in and we'd take them out of the trees sometimes. Mm -hmm. And now the, uh, the AVG 
worked out of a field in uh, Rangoon for a while. But by the time we went over there, by the time I got overseas, the AVG had been disbanded. And uh, they were brought into the U.S. Army Air Corps. Or uh, they, could, they could leave the AVG if they wanted to do, and we ended up with some of their mechanics on our flight line, the good boys. And a lot of those AVG guys, uh, rest your soul. But uh, there was a book of guy that wrote, God is my co-pilot. Yeah. And he was flying P-40s. And he take take off from this field, and he, chapter said, we went down to Rangoon and toured around for a while. Well, from where he took off to Rangoon was nearly a three hour flight. The P-40 carried fuel for just under two hours. Yeah. So he toured around over Rangoon for a while, not much going on, so went on a bummo. And before he was through with it, he'd been in the air for eight hours, shot down three Japanese. <laughs> I guess he just picked up different planes along the way. God was his co-pilot. Yeah. There you come up to me. <laughs> Quite literally. Yeah, the rest you saw. <laughs> Um, we still have a few minutes of tape left. I guess uh, what I'd like to ask is uh, how do you think your experiences in World War II affected you later in life? Oh, uh, tremendously. And that, the overseas experience, number one, uh, just getting along with people was one thing or another. And uh, I marveled at the fact the Air Corps selection system, you know, it was all tests and all done by paper and book and everything else, but somehow or other, 99% of those people were shelled out of the same pod. Mm. And I thought that the most remarkable achievement that any military group could attain was to establish a test procedure that would pick out this very narrow strip of people from here to there. That was the first thing. And then the second thing, of course, was um, getting accustomed to the fact that although they were nice guys, some of them hadn't been trained the same way we were. I was, for example. And things would come up missing. Mm -hmm. We had to learn to hide your stuff, or lock it up, or put it away, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and then, of course, the uh, ability to get results from people who you couldn't communicate with by language, you know, the uh, houseboys and the uh, various people we worked with. And the uh, probably the greatest thing was that what coordination and cooperation could do. Soldiers on the ground, tired, unarmed, not sufficiently armed, planes in the air, overarmed, <laughs> to do the work they had to have done. Yeah. It, it, it's marvelous training. And then in my last year in St. Louis, I, uh, I probably learned more from that than anything else. I, I had no, absolutely, no aversion to the colored people in any way. I hadn't known any, and to this day I don't have, because some of those guys are the finest people you'll ever meet anywhere. Yeah. And what I marveled at about that was that they could sense enmity. Just like a dog knows when you're afraid, you know. He'll attack you and tear you to pieces. But if you're not afraid, he's your friend. And s sensing that I had no enmity, they became the finest group of soldiers you'll ever see. I've got a picture, some, I had a picture, I guess it's at home. We, uh, I grew, from that group of uh, boys, I discovered, you know, you could take 1,300 men, you've got somebody that can do almost anything. I discovered we had enough musicians to make a band. Mm -hmm. So we made a band. Mm -hmm. I had a, had a second lieutenant there that was a music, had a band music major, and we put together a band. And uh, we, uh, we held our own little Saturday afternoon marches. They loved that, you know, the, the, anything, march, and they, uh, the colonel, that uh, learned that we had a band and were marching, so he declared that we would have every Saturday afternoon, we'd have competition of every unit on the entire base of Scott Field. 
and each winter, each Saturday, would get a prize. So we went into that, and by golly, we took the prize home the first time. And when the next Saturday came along, we took the prize home. <laughs> <laughs> finally, we, we didn't always win, but we did one more than we lost. And finally, one Saturday, there was a deal with uh, Lord Louis Mountbatten was visiting the base for some reason. And we had this big old deal, and my guys loved marching so much that when they'd hear the music playing, we'd do the big eight-man turn. They'd practice that, eight men at a time, with an eight-man pivot. And to practice, they'd bob their head on each beat, you know, and take the short steps and bob their head. It's kind of beautiful. Eight, eight heads going up and down all at the same time, you know. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, so when we got in that competition, I told the guys, I said, hey, we're going to have to cut out on this because everybody else here, you know, and everybody doesn't bob their heads. <laughs> but this day, the colonel, I just got my men lined up and was ready, to, you know, waiting for the call to march off. The head Thomas. And I turned around and the colonel's cooking his finger at me. So I went double time enough to see what he's doing. He says, Lieutenant, if you take the trophy home today, you'll be excused from any further competition. Oh, yes, sir. Yeah. <laughs> and just a minute, Lieutenant. Do you suppose you could talk your men into doing their special pivot? <laughs> <laughs> he wanted to see it. He, he wanted to see it. He, he wanted more to, to see it. Yep. So I went back and told the troops, I said, you know, if we win the trophy this time, we don't do this anymore. And not only that, but he wants to see our special turn. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> boy, boy, did we mow him down. This, he laid, they laid it out there, didn't oh, they? Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, you get a lot of pride out of something like that. And uh, the fact that here's guys that were, most of them, some of them, hadn't done anything, hadn't been responsible for anything yeah. until they got that uniform on. And I told them to conduct themselves with the dignity of soldier, you know. And they finally got through to them. I used to see them, they've got a slouchy walk, you know, and I'd see them up over there wearing that uniform going slouching along the field, and I'd scream at them, clear across the parade ground, soldier! Yeah. You got a uniform on, walk like that! That's right, stand up. <laughs> <laughs> they can take off, you know. It, it got to where any time they were outside the barracks and in that uniform, they were soldiers. Mm -hmm. And I recognized it by